are leading the charge to invest in women-led startups within large institutional firms and on the ground level as venture capitalists. Today, we get the special treat to hear from two of those investors as well as a trailblazing entrepreneur. And with that, I would like to hand it over to our moderator, Raheem Fagiri. Thanks so much, Kyle. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. And you know, when we hear these stats, it uh, can be a bit discouraging. You know, but I think the important thing is to really think about like, how do we bridge that gap and think about the solutions. And we're so lucky to be with two women that are really the epitome of how we're sol solving this problem um, and really bridging that gap. So as Kyle mentioned, I'm Raham Figiri. I'm, I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called AppDeco, a tech startup based here in New York City. We are a marketplace for buying and selling furniture. And I'd have to say, um, I've actually experienced firsthand these in inequities um, while fundraising, but um, you know, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to be able to sort of navigate that space and um, have been able to successfully raise over eight million in funding. And that's definitely, especially for minority is, it's, um, and the stats are actually even more staggering than the 2%. But um, that being said, you know, one of the, one of our investors actually is uh, Eve and her slab. And so I'm so lucky and excited to be here to learn from both of you. Um, so I think it's just great to jump right in. And you know, I'd love to start off by um, sort of going through your background and you know, why you started Hearst Lab and Plum Alley, um, Andrea and Eve. You wanna go first? Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's really um, uh, particularly special to be here because I think it's been, if I'm doing my math right, maybe 16 years ago that I actually co-chaired the Social Enterprise Conference when I was a student at Columbia Business School. And let me tell you, this is um, much more well run. We were still in Eurus running the conference. It was probably a few years in. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, I'm so proud as an alum of Columbia to see how much the Tamer Center and the Social Enterprise Program has really flourished. Um, and it's uh, been really, really a special part of my life. Um, and I would say my time here at Columbia very much shaped the trajectory of my journey, um, you know, sometimes subconsciously, not always consciously, um, since having left um, uh, Columbia, but um, uh, really influenced um, some of the choices I made. So um, just quick background, you know, had a traditional investment banking career on Wall Street even after business school, but I became very passionate about better engaging women as investors and had started my career in the tech bubble, um, so those of you who are in school now may not remember that, but um, started my career in the early 2000s covering technology companies um, and helping them raise capital and um, you know, just became very passionate after about a decade where I had seen that, wow, you know, I was um, you know, doing relatively well financially, getting my loans paid down, but felt um, a very consistent conversation and dialogue about how do we really accelerate and advance equity, uh, particularly for, for women on the gender front within leadership across industries. And it became clear to me a big missing piece and component of it was um, you know, more equitable engagement around investing um, on both sides, from institutional and as well as from, from women um, as investors. And so I ended up doing a global study on women investors um, th with a think tank and a few banks and published a book. And, it and I knew at the time I had a, an entrepreneurial um, perspective on wanting to actually build an investment model that really better engaged women. And so after that experience, I co-founded Plumali Investments, um, which is a venture firm. And it, um, it's a bit unique um, in that it's not um, traditional institutional um, limited partners who've invested um, in Plum Alley, rather. We've um, started and over the last four years have engaged over 400 individuals and families. Um, I'm proud to say 70%, 75% of those who've joined Plum Alley um, and been members and invested with us are women. Um, and we have a model where we um, uh, have a team of investment professionals at Source um, and Diligence founders, um, startups uh, that are founded by women in the technology and healthcare space and giving an opportunity to a much broader base of investors who want to engage and invest in not only you know, cutting edge technology and healthcare companies, but we also have an overlaid lens around companies that are driving progress in the world. Um, not definitively impact necessarily, they're all in different shapes and forms, but, um, but they all need to exist in the world for a variety of reasons. Um, 
and we focus on companies that are really raising their first institutional round of capital, so kind of Series A stage companies. Um, and uh, proud to say that we've closed 18 deals. We've invested, um, we're approaching 20 million, um, and you know, care deeply about driving impact and making the venture ecosystem more inclusive and diverse, um, both from an investor perspective as well as from a founder perspective. So uh, I'm, I'm just a chief believer. I didn't go to business school. Uh, I don't crunch numbers. Uh, I meet founders, and um, I um, follow my, my heart and my soul. That's our business model. Uh, I came to this world that uh, is, is much more quant than I am uh, by being in a large corporate and saying, you know, really the only thing I want my obituary to say is that 50% of all the women uh, in corporate, 50% uh, uh, of the leaders in corporates were women. So that was sort of a, you know, a simply articulatable goal, but actually continues and was certainly um, much harder to figure out the roadway than to articulate the gold. So uh, that was the, uh, that was sort of the quest I was on, was to find more company and more uh, women uh, at Hearst, which is a, a media, a healthcare, a finance, a transportation company, very large company uh, in many, many sectors. And I thought, you know, there are some remarkable women here. How do we find a way to put them together, to work together, to bring more women in, and to ultimately, you know, push through massive changes? So that was my, you know, simply articulated goal. Uh, that, uh, I, I think we became uh, more action-oriented about three years ago when we started to look at the data, and, the, and there were three pieces of data that had a, a really strong impact, I think, on all of the uh, women. There were 50 of us that, that came together to do this. And the, the data uh, showed that 87% uh, better decisions were made by more inclusive teams, that 41% higher returns on equity were probable when a woman was leading, and that six times higher in innovation uh, as a mindset from all employees happened when you had inclusive companies. So we put all of that together, and then we sh surely found the, the data that uh, Kyle mentioned that only 2% of the, the venture, and, and as uh, Raheem says, less in the uh, diversity context, money was going to women. Uh, and Carla Harris, who was at Morgan Stanley, and is at Mo Morgan Stanley, and I got together for breakfast, and we said, you know, if we wanted to take on both of those you know, women and diverse uh, teams, how could we do it in a manner that would be successful? And one of the things we determined was they needed a lot of time and a lot of help. So we got together and put together two labs, one at Morgan Stanley and one at Hearst, which would allow companies to flow back and forth and have more time, more money, and more support. That's where we began um, three, three years ago. Uh, I love the title of this uh, panel. You know, where are all the female founders? They're everywhere. Like, they're everywhere. I, I see them as I walk in the park. I mean, they're everywhere. They're just a different breed of cat, right? You have to be looking for a different breed of cat. They, they have a different diet. They live in different places. They build different things. They, have, they run their companies like they run their lives. They, they, they work on products, not necessarily growth. They don't speak in numbers. They speak in ideas. And so if you think of it that way, they're everywhere. There's, like, no shortage of them. So, you know, once, once we got sort of into this, it, it was really hard to decide who should be in the lab. And, and just to be clear, a lab is not an incubator, right? An incubator is where you think about some ideas and you begin to have, you know, the development of some ideas. And venture, to be very clear, not to be critical, is all about making money. I mean, that is the primary goal of venture. They're very, that's a cat that's easy to understand. You know, their questions are clear, their motives are clear. I mean, I kind of like it, right? They, they, they are not apologetic about what they're doing and we learn a ton for them. But a lab is something entirely different. It's in the middle. So what we did was we said, if we could bring women founders into Hearst, which has 365 businesses, give them some money, give them anywhere from nine months to two years, give them the time to build their products, connect them with this 50 group of women plus another 500 people at Hearst who are interested in participating, what would happen? Now, corporates are not good at this usually, right? They bring in kind of new ideas and new people and they sit on them and they kill them, right? That's the typical model for a corporate American. I mean, we could go through, I mean, Disney, God bless them, you know, tried hard. Turner, God bless them, they tried hard. 
Uh, Comcast, God bless them, they try hard. It, it's very difficult to do if you want to control it in the world of sort of P&L and large companies. So what we did was we made it very independent and we are unapologetically pro-founder. I think when you're unapologetically pro-founder and everyone's clear about that, I learned that from venture, be clear. It's just that you know some people would say, what is, you know, but Hearst has ownership and interest in these companies. I said, I know, but our model is that if we support them to do it the way they want to do it, we believe we'll actually do better than venture will. So fast forward, we've looked at 2,100 companies. We've chosen 23. We have 23 companies at Hearst in New York, the Netherlands, China, and about to open in the UK. Those companies are now worth three years later $450 million, $450 million. That tells me women are pretty good at business. I, I, I want to rest my case on that one for a minute. And, and Hearst's ROI on those companies is 75%. So, you know, it's a, it's a different model, it's a different way of doing it, but our goals were to make women founders successful commercially, because I think in the end, that's what is a, it's a good, now I'm back to the business school side of it, right? You know, that's, a, that's something you can all kind of hang on, uh, number one. Uh, and number two, it was to have more women promoted. So in the last three years, we've put five women into quite senior positions at Hearst that no one had really heard of. They were incredibly talented, but just hadn't found their way around the structures of a large organization. And then third, we wanted to meaningfully disrupt ourselves. So imagine the elders at Hearst now beginning to see in a very vivid way, I mean, you know, if they ever have the opportunity to have lunch with Rick, it's like, whoa, that's great, right? So, and it's great for the founders to have lunch with people who've run big businesses. So it's been, a, um, it's been that ecosystem that we've honed continually. And just to finish about the lab, we have um, four or five uh, fellows at the lab who do all sorts of things like user interface and DevOps and sales help and consumer help. And then we have, of course, the scouts. We call them the Hearst Scouts that help connect the, the, the companies into various companies. And they're, they're, they're in technology, they're in services, they're in content. We do all sorts of things. We really choose founders, not business lines. But the business line has to have something. We don't do washing machines because Hearst doesn't really know about washing machines. So we do do something. So we have healthcare, we have finance, we have transportation, and we have content services and tech. That's the basic model. Um, it's been extraordinary. In the last week, we've had two companies uh, go from seed to series A. One uh, closed at a post uh, 70 million. Uh, these were seeds, remember. They came in anywhere from nine months to two years ago. Uh, a second one uh, will be closing in November. Just got a, a term sheet from a uh, extremely uh, aggressive venture capitalist who's everyone would want their funding. And that's going to be a, uh, a post at 50. We sold a company to PepsiCo a month ago. Uh, and we sold a company earlier to Tamer Media. When I say we, meaning we founders, right? We help them with the, with the buy, the sell, and the decision making. So it's been, um, there's not been problem raising money, you know, uh, ironically. The one instance where, which was a minority company, not Rahim's company, that had a little bit of trouble raising money. We don't lead at Hearst after the first round, and I decided we were going to lead on that one. A phenomenal company, phenomenal growth, phenomenal team. And the minute, of course, uh, you know, we led, uh, all the other bunnies came below, and they've got all their money now. Yeah, that's the stunning classic thing. Classic FOMO. Yeah, yeah, right, classic FOMO. But anyway, that's what we're able to do as a lab, right? We're not a, we're not a, we're not a fund. We're not an incubator. We're an iterative process where people come to learn, be successful, and they've been remarkably helpful to making women, Hearst Women, successful, which, as you remember, going back to where we started, 50% of all senior positions at Hearst should be filled by women and people of color, and I would like that to be my obituary. So, Andreas, um, so also Plum Alley is not a fund, right? And it's also not a lab or an accelerator. How would you define Plum Alley? Um, really, Plum Alley is structured as a um, venture platform, if you will. Um, you know, uh, you know, traditional funds have limited partners. They traditionally are institutional investors, be it pension funds, foundations, endowments, some uh, you know high net worth individuals. But we very intentionally getting started. One, it felt so strongly that another fund in the ecosystem isn't going to change the game. We need all of it. We need labs. We, we do need people in the angel space, you know, we do need funds, but we also, you know, we felt very strongly, you know, there's some analogies here in terms of wanting to get um, women in particular, be that women who have been 
or are executives across industries or are part of families or have been philanthropists. Uh, you know, our mission and view of the world is that we're at a very exciting time where innovation is changing at the fastest pace in history. And that we said that like two years ago, but it is still, you know, every year um, usurping and changing even faster. And we really need to have diversity of thought, just going back to some of the statistics Eve shared, on what we're innovating and bringing into the world. And we want to have diversity of thought also in which companies are getting funded and why we're funding them. You know, we, back to what I said, as we look for, for technology and healthcare companies driving progress in the world, you know, we're not at this to just fund the next gaming app um, or, you know, even pure consumer company that's not, you know, doesn't really need to exist in the world and is not productive. We, we think of productive as a really important assessment in our own analysis beyond the numbers. And we want to diversify the decision makers that are allocating capital. And also we want to diversify those that are benefiting from investing in the asset class. I mean, if you look at what's happened just in the last few years with all the IPOs out of Silicon Valley, when we have created the next generation of Rockefellers, Carnegie's, et cetera, and pretty much no women have really participated in the cap tables, a lot of the companies that have gone public. And it has a huge multiplier effect on many other areas, philanthropy, political giving, uh, you know, other areas of investing. In addition, you know, I, I having done the, the book I mentioned earlier and the research on women investors, the women who I talk to in the interviews and focus groups as part of that um, whole experience, many of them were running big companies, were running business lines in companies. And they all care about changing and getting to equity in the Fortune 500. But most of them you know, shared with me privately, I'm pretty fatigued and I'm not sure we're gonna get there. I really believe our best shot is making sure the next generation of companies that we acquire or go public already have built from the ground up an inclusive and diverse culture and they're creating products that have that mindset. And I want to be part of that ecosystem but I don't have a way in. Because back to traditional venture funds, traditional venture funds, like most you know, private equity or hedge funds or others, you know, by nature of the economics of the business model, they cater to larger investors that tend, tend to be institutions. And you know, even when they do bring in individuals, it's a very networked, clubby game. And it's very hard for women to break in. And so Plum Alley, we set up our, our model to actually have a model that's constructed as a membership. So individuals can join as members, women and men, because we felt strongly this wasn't just by women for women, really important for men to be engaged as investors in these amazing founders like you. They have a lot of money too. And <laughs> they do, but you know, it was, a, it, I, I noticed in my own personal experience, you know, my husband would come home and he works on Wall Street and he'd bring home all these deals and I'd be like, I don't care about this restaurant or a new fund or real estate fund, but, became clear to me that I want him to talk about these companies to his colleagues. And it's not just about it being a woman entrepreneur. It's about this amazing environmental intelligence company that's now measuring air quality at a hyper-local level. And yes, it happens to be you know, a woman founder. And the more that you know, that narrative can, can um, occur, they're like, oh, I want to invest in that company. That sounds really interesting. Um, so th that our model has in been able to engage a lot of individuals as well as families obviously particularly women. And we have a learning component, although it's not a heavy learning kind of boot camp. We essentially open up where our members get to learn from our investment team the analysis that has been completed and be part of the experience. So they get to meet the founders. They get to hear about the business. I think it's actually a really critical piece of reaching more parity around leadership because you classically here, even when women are in executive positions, a lot of times they're not necessarily managing P&Ls. And there is a, you know, often a perception, a bias, true or not, that there's not enough risk taking. And you have to have some, you know, more experiences around evaluating businesses, appreciating how to take risks. They're going to be losers. And, you know, you learn from that. That's an important part of the learning component. So we designed Plum Alley to enable our investor base to be part of that experience and build their own portfolio of direct investments. And I like to think of it as intentional investing. You know, members come to Plum Alley, they join Plum Alley. We are a partner for them where they're getting to see very highly curated deals with our lens, but they get to pick and choose. There's no obligation to invest, but they get to opt in on deals that really resonate with them. They usually tend to be either at the intersection of problems they want to see solved in the world, be it education, environment, health, or areas of curiosity and interest 
being able to learn about what's happening in AI, machine learning, or some of these new technologies, or areas where they have expertise. And then we're able to add a lot more value to our founders because we have a group of individuals that um, you know, often have a Rolodex or have social capital, relationship capital. We're not doing the rolls up your sleeves, you know, technical um, uh, expertise in, that you can get out of a lab, but we partner nicely with labs or other um, you know, organizations like Hearst because we can tap the networks of our members that are much bigger than our team of eight and bring those introductions. I always say for female founders, not only are they not getting the equitable ca capital, even when they get the funding, they don't get the same level of social capital and door opening. And so that's a big piece of what we bring to the table. Also, I think, you know, I, I guess I would push the intentionality a little bit further. Um, you know, it, it may sound rigid, it may sound, sound radical, but I, I actually think at the end of the day, um, you gotta be associated with women first as a concept. You know, we all agree men should be part of it, men can be friends in labs, et cetera. But if you're not intentional, it just gets watered down. And I, you know, I'll give you some examples where it becomes very vivid in a lab. You know, you'll have a lot of people who will come in and say, I'm a big believer in women. And then you look at the cap table and it just doesn't get you there. And so, you know, we've had some really interesting debates on what it means to have a women-led company. Is it just the woman being a CEO? Do you have to have equal capital? And you know we've learned a lot from it, but I will tell you, in you know 100% of the times where the cap table hasn't been uh, equal, when I say that equal, 51% or more, uh, by owned by the woman, um, you know companies do people men exercise their rights, mm -hmm. right? That there's not a collaborative thing when you got when you own 60% and she owns 40%, and so the places there have really been issues, and I would say the less successful companies in our lab have been where we haven't been as intentional in that regard. And then when you sort of shift back and you say, you know, what does intentionality look like once you bring those companies in? So of the 185 people that have come into the lab, uh, the statistics are really interesting. 60% are women and 48% are people of color. Now, they don't have diversity programs. You know, they don't have time for HR. They don't have time for, you know, sitting around and, you know, contemplating the navel on this issue. They are intentional by their actions, by their product and how they run their companies. But in the end, it's that cap table and it's the leadership that allows the intentionality to actually deliver on the goal. And so, you know, in the end, I'm, um, I've found myself more radical. And you, know, you, you, you can also look at some of the data we've seen at Hearst where we studied through our Oracle um, HCM, Human Capital Management System, we have found um, a 67% lower turnover with women, particularly a little bit less with men who've had a connection to the lab. So if you're really talking about intentionality, you know, these, these yes, women are, men are friends of the lab and they've been critically helpful. I mean, Raheem, you dealt with our logistics a aviation people. I mean, they're all men and they're magnificent and we love them. But from an intentionality point of view, you know, it, it is the women who have worked in the lab, who've touched the lab companies that have stayed at Hearst and said, I'm investing in my career, I'm investing in a place that you know, is, has seen some ability to recognize this, and that intentionality is moving me toward my 50%, as well as giving success commercially to these companies. So, you know, again, I think the lesson from this is if we had you know, 25 major corporates that had a lab, and could get some funding and some support from a Plum and from a Sequoia. I mean, when you look at the venture that's invested in our companies, it's Sequoia, it's Fred Wilson, it's Index, it's Excel. I mean, these are big venture companies. It's not like we're foregoing any of those, but the intentionality of the lab is to make these women and, and, and particularly diverse uh, leaders successful, and that just looks different. And I, I, I just think that unless we're really intentional about that, it does become a little bit, you know, and, and when you need to make money and you need a certain return and you have a certain budget, you know, sometimes it does make sense to, to be a little less intentional or to be more open to different ways. But I have to say, I, I've really bought into that very slightly narrow definition of intentionality. So why do you think there is this massive funding gap between, you know, 2% of all funding goes to women? Well, 2% of all funding goes to female-only founded companies. So at Plum Alley, we look, obviously fund si single female founders, but we also focus on funding gender-diverse founded teams um, because there's a lot of amazing women founders who have male co-founders. 
Um, and so f it's, it's actually closer to 15%. It's still obviously a very dismal number. But if you look at um, what we call gender diverse founded teams, that's about 15% of total capital. Um, uh, and, and it's inched up over the last 10 years. We did an analysis of pitch book data um, probably a year ago now. And um, you, you know, you're seeing improvement at the seed stage. Uh, I think it was probably something in the seven or it was sub 10%, seven or eight percent. Um, and it's you know doubled, but when you look at the amount of money, it's really actually you know it's still it's it's still so tiny. Um, and when you look later stage, it's even worse. You know, so the numbers are higher than that 14% at the seed stage, but it gets dragged down on a weighted average to 14% when you look at Series B, Series C, and beyond. Definitely Series A, which is one of the reasons we wanted to focus on Series A. But the fundamental question you ask is why? Why the gap? I mean. It's a very complex problem. It's not something, it, there's no silver bullet in my opinion. I do fundamentally think that um, it's the nature of the network and the nature of, um, you know, this was a very, is, venture is a very small asset class in comparison to the, the wider, you know, markets. And it's a very small group of people who um, start funds um, to make money. And they go fund the people they know um, who have businesses that are most likely to have, you know, breakout success. And they usually mine their own networks. And those networks tend to not be that diverse because the nature of the business, you know, started in that um, uh, relatively homogeneous, you know, network. So I, I personally think one of the, the biggest um, challenges is just the sheer, you know, um, challenges of breaking open the barriers within the closed loop network system, which is, is you know, there is there's changes happening. A lot of funds in the last three years post Me Too have kind of brought in a female partner. A lot of good research showing that when you have at least one female decision maker, it drives better returns and more women get funded. So that's, you know, part of the solution. But we can't keep knocking on the same doors and expecting different answers. You, you have to create other funding models like labs, you know, like, you know, even just getting, you know, at an angel stage, which is very important and organic, you know, getting those companies, you know, off the ground, either in a lab, in an incubator, in an accelerator, or angel. And then we do need more, you know, at every step of the funding chain to be intentional with how we're making sure that there's diversified um, sourcing on deals. And then you still have to address the bias of the evaluation on due diligence. I mean, Harvard came out with a great study, also probably a, maybe 18 months ago, on the way in which women founders are evaluated and the number of times they're getting asked risk-oriented questions or, you know, downside, you know, questions on, um, you know, the, the business versus just tell me how you can make this a billion dollar unicorn. And, you know, so that unconscious bias in the evaluation process is yet another component. So it's, there's a lot of complexities and nuances. I, I would add one other piece that I, th that I think we've noticed, and, and this is where a, a lab can help with sort of decks and how one put for, puts forth the story to different people. But I, I think there's also just a fundamental, um, you know, uh, you all remember the, uh, the yellow dress and the purple dress, and you just see it differently depending on mm. how you see it. Um, and I think the, the fundamental problem is that venture as a model is about growth. It's about uh, growth in terms of valuation. And I think the problem with that is that, you know, it's a bit more of a crapshoot. So if you're going to, you know, put a lot of money into a crapshoot, you're going to do it with somebody you know. I mean, what we do at the lab is we create products. So, you know, when venture folks say, well, is this a Series A? Is this a Series B? You know, what, where, where, where is this sitting? And I say, well, we have new products, medium products, and developed products. And was that A, B, and C? I said, no, well, we've had one that's gone from C to B. You know, we've had one that's gone from seed to seed to seed to A. Well, what's the theory? I said, the theory is great products, solving a problem that women have identified needs to be solved. And it's not about valuation without regard for revenue and profit. I mean, we, we, at the lab, when I say we're, you know, $450 million up, the most valuable companies are actually still at a cap, a note cap, or a early Series A at 20 or 30 million, and they're worth a whole lot more than that. But women who are profitable are not just out running the valuation scale, they're running the product. And so that actually is a different breed of cat again in terms of funding. Now, what I think we're gonna see, you know, 
and you all can prove me wrong here, you know, in five years, is I think those companies are going to actually be more valuable than any of the IPOs and the unicorns. I mean, I, you're seeing it now with the IPOs, right? I mean, you know, going out at one level and, you know, falling 30% and, you know, creating serious problems on a whole variety of levels. I think when our lab companies go out and are successful, that you are going to see products that really work, products that people really want to use, and products that actually change the way people live. And so that's sort of our bet. And uh, I don't know that that's a series A, B, C issue. That's a, all, you love all your children the same, but they need different things at different times. So that's sort of the, it's a different model altogether. And until we get to sort of, you know, venture coming around and saying that might actually be right, I think at that point you're not going to have any barriers. So that's kind of my five-year, you know, vision of where hopefully it goes. I mean, it sounds like also just from a funding perspective, you know, just thinking about new models of funding period, right? So venture has sort of been the traditional way to raise capital, but now there's other ways. And I think like opening that up and people knowing about it. I think that's it. such an important point because, you know, venture and back to Eve, what you, you said at the outset, a venture is a very specific type of capital. And I do see um, a lot of companies that are saying, oh, I can't get venture funding, but they're not venture backable businesses. You really have to understand what venture is intended to do. Venture is intended to outperform the public equity market where they're yielding higher returns because there's higher risk, higher upside and downside, and they have limited partners that they too are running a business that they have to answer to those shareholders in terms of the LPs in the fund and generate returns and demonstrate that it was worth putting their money there versus somewhere else. Um, not all businesses are gonna grow like that and not our businesses you know, are really appropriate for venture funding. And so I think that there's a huge opportunity for more innovation in capital sourcing for businesses that may um, have a longer runway in terms of how they grow. Um, or there's, I think, a lot, there, there's some areas, and this has kind of had fits and starts over the last mm, five to 10 years, are you know, revenue-based um, financing that may be more appropriate for certain types of businesses um, that you know, may not fit the typical mold of venture. So I think there's a lot of exciting areas to innovate around venture. I think one of the things you've gotten out about the lab is you're, you're not beholden to LPs, so you can be patient capital, if you will. Um, and uh, there's, um, there's a need for that, especially when we look at just so many really, really important problems we're trying to solve in the world. And you know that takes time to build those thoughtful products and technology, prove them out, and not try to gun for it and you know just to drive up valuation, but to actually thoughtfully build a product that you can test, get approval, whether it's a healthcare product through the FDA or other products. And I think there are increasingly foundations and families and um, you know sources of capital that are playing in that space because they really may be more of a 10-year or maybe even a little longer in terms of being able to hit an inflection on growth versus Venture is traditionally seven years, and that's because you raise money, you tell people, I'm going to take your money, I'm going to take $100 million or $500 million, and I'll return it at you know, 3x in seven years. And they, that, that drives their decision making and their intentionality around that decision making versus saying, look, we're going to try to solve these problems. It may take us 10 years, and what we, uh, we're, we do believe we're going to get you, you know, solid returns, but it's a different time horizon and liquidity. You can be with us for 10 years? I like I it. I would love to. Right. But so think Forever. About, right. So right. So th think about that though. So you know, I, I think that's where corporates come back in, right? So you know, corporates have got you know kind of a black eye because they've you know they've killed a lot of babies, right? So they don't really know how to do it. And so if we can create some models where people really see that there's a benefit to that and an independence to that, I mean, I'll give you just one example, which is I think t really to what you're saying about sort of different models. I was asked to go speak at a healthcare conference in, you know, in Dallas, which, you know, I don't go speak at healthcare conferences in Dallas, and I was like, if it were in New York or, you know, I, I, I don't know anything about healthcare. No, they wanted to hear, you know, this is for senior women, and it's their biggest conference at all of my healthcare colleagues, and they really want to hear about the lab, and I said, great, well, if you'll, I said to the head of, uh, president of health, if you'll send the top 25 people in health, I don't know all of them, there's 20,000 people at hers. I said, if you'll agree to send the top 25 people in your, you know, health division, I'll go to Dallas and we'll do a lab and we'll all get to know each other. We'll have some more scouts and then that's a great idea. He said, sure, absolutely, let's do it. So I go to this you know, room of 500 like SVPs, EVPs of like Cardinal and United Healthcare, I mean all these huge, huge companies. And I basically said at the end of the 
you know, of my, of my, my little conversation, I said, you know, you guys will have fully failed if 25 companies, that, if, if not 25 of the 100 companies in this room haven't created a lab by the time you guys get back here next year. I just think that's like the fundamental KPI you all ought to be working in. You know, and they got up and they clapped and I said to my guys, I said, isn't that great? I said, meanwhile, while you're working on that, please do some business with Hearst Health. And of course, you know, my guys were, oh, yeah, you know, the sales guys were thrilled, right? So, and they actually did do some business with Hearst Health. But what was interesting about it was about three months later, there's a group of 15 of them that got together and they said, we need to come to Hearst Lab and spend two days. You know, we need to understand what this lab thing is. And so in November, we are going to be hosting, I don't know these people, but I know their titles and I know their companies. And, you know, and of course, they've got more cash flow than, you know, most companies. So they're, we're going to ask them to pay for our white labeling of their lab. But I'm hoping that we will create some number of labs this year. And then, you know, just like venture funds kind of get started and get going, there's a ton of money out there. It's not the money, in my view. It's the services that go around what it is, you know, women are building. So if we could have 25 you know, labs a year from now, I, you know, that's a KPI that would show me that, you know, corporates had come to their time. And that will help, you know, women, all of the, as you say, all of the sort of, you know, uh, ancillary effects. But maybe, you know, I think it'd be useful, Raheem, I'm not the moderator, but can I ask a question? Of course. Um, can you tell the audience about um, AppDeco? Because it is such a remarkable product and you have a remarkable team and it's a remarkable story of how you founded it and how you all came together, uh, starting at the University of Maryland and you know moving now into this world where you have a very valuable company that generates a lot of revenue and uh, is on its way to be, uh, if I may say, a unicorn. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so I started App Deco out of my own frustration trying to sell furniture on Craigslist and just had a really, really bad experience. Um, before that, I worked at Goldman. I'm an engineer by trade um, and then left Goldman to go to business school. I went to, not Columbia, I went to Wharton. Um, but uh, there, that's kind of where the idea came about. I was trying to, I was moving back to New York. And, you know, our ex I really didn't think I was going to start a company right after business school, but um, I just, I got the itch, but also I just saw a problem that I really, really wanted to solve. Um, and I got very, very excited about it. So, you know, fast forward, we're five years in. Um, if anybody had mentioned to me before how hard it is, um, one, to start a company, but two, like the, the, the funding space, um, you know, it's 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 kind of been eye opening. But uh, what's exciting is, you know, there are solutions. And you know, actually, we went also. I met Carla Harris first, and that's how I met Eve. Um, so even just building that network um, has been instrumental to our business and our survival, but also our growth. So um, so I guess sort of in summary, like uh, we're a testament to that there is an, an a different way out there. So it's not necessarily a traditional way where you raise a seed from a big VC and then, you know, you raise another, an A and B, a C and Ds. There's other ways to do this and you can still be a large company and grow um, sustainably uh, without having to sacrifice sort of your core mission. I, I think there is something to build it and they will come. I mean, you start hitting numbers and they will come. Um, you just need the right um, environment to kind of start to hit those milestones and inflection points, because eventually, once you know, th th they, th you know, they being traditional venture funds are all about the numbers. <laughs> so, uh, absolutely. Who, who here has heard of AppDeco? All right, <laughs> yeah, baby, <Yeah>. amazing. <laughs> Go buy and sell. <laughs> See, isn't that a great? I mean, That's just all right. Cool, yeah. Rest, rest, rest for Hell's case on that one, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Wonderful. Yeah, um, I mean, it's so like for us, even just. I've had to sort of learn um, the difference, kind of just kind of by going through through it. You know, we went through an accelerator first. We were in Y Combinator, and then we tried to go for venture funding and um, had some luck. But actually, we ended up raising more from angels initially, um, then raised from some venture, then you know, then Morgan Stanley and Hearst, and now we actually have our last round was led by venture. So it was it was very interesting to sort of go through that because I think when you read. You know, if you read the tech crunches of the world and the Forbes of the world, it's always like so and so company is you know raised 15 million from you know Sequoia or what have you, and like you think this is the only way to build a company, and if you don't do it that way, then you know there's no point to actually build a company. But 
I, what I'm ex why, that's why I'm excited to even to be here, right, and to have this conversation because it is possible. Um, there's not one linear path to do this. Uh, and I'm just gonna put a plot. I don't know who, who's in media out there, but I, I think we need more narratives and storytelling because, you know, the media loves the darling stories, and there's not enough stories about non-traditional paths of funding, and I would love and and not enough stories about. Um, you know the different types of businesses, different types of you know investor models. Um, so I think that if any of you are in media, that, I mean we really need to sh reshape the narrative and also shine light on you know the different paths. So important. That's a, such a good point. Well, I, I don't want to. I want to keep some time for questions, but I have um, I have so many questions. But um, if what would the world look like if you know women got the same amount of funding as men? have more products. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to say, I mean, um, I, I really truly believe because we have a database of over 4,000 founders that are um, meet our criteria, so obviously they all have at least one woman in the founding team. Um, but, and I think we were talking about this a little beforehand with, with Ray, we consistently see that, um, and not that m men don't want to do this, but we consistently see ev almost every company we meet that has a female founder is really you know, trying to bring something into the world um, that they, they feel is solving a problem and is really needs to exist in the world. And um, I do believe that we don't, I, I, I may be devil's advocate here, I don't know that we need more products per se. I do think we need more productive products and services that, go with that. Are, are addressing and making, I mean we, um, you know, say like they have to be driving progress in the world or adding to humanity or human value, making our lives better through the environment, through education, or you know, if it's a consumer product, it's it's not just polluting in 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 and of itself. So I do believe that if we had more equity um, with more diversity in companies, we would see more of that. And I also think if we had more equity in investors, we would actually be backing more companies that were productive and not necessarily companies that are just about the hockey stick growth that aren't necessarily that valuable in the long-term sustainability of the world. Right, so um, we got the, the message, it's a Q&A time, so I um, want to open it up for questions. Yeah, over there. Hi, my name is Michael Smolens, the founder of DotSub. It's a technology business in language to enable video created in one language to be available in other languages. And you keep talking about the world, but in more than half of the world, w women aren't even part of society. They can't drive in many countries. They can't do a lot of things. So we're talking here about the US market and the Western European market. When you, but when you want to really deal with the world, which is where 7.6 billion people live, there's a lot more fundamental issues of women equality than there are women on the board or women founder. So it's, so it's very important to realize that when we're attacking this, which is very important here, there are bigger problems or different problems to be solving globally. And I, I want to tell you about a company that is in the lab that has actually taken on something really critical that you're talking about. It's called Power to Fly, and it was a platform for women engineers, and particularly in the Middle East, where there's been, you know, obviously many more constraints on what women can do than other parts of the world. Uh, Power to Fly has become uh, a lifesaver to women who are educated but who are now not allowed to leave their immediate surrounds unless they have the permission of their husband. And so Power to Fly matches engineers with projects and with companies and we in the last three years they have uh, they've had 552 women involved in engineering projects from around the world connecting them into actual projects which technologies allowed them to participate in without it being inappropriate culturally and also netting them quite significant sums of money so I hear you I think that's a really critical critical question, and, and we look for companies all the time that are global. I, I could tell you about a skate park that launched in rural India, in the central India, with the lower caste and the upper caste, that one of the rules is that women have the rights to the skateboards before men. 
the second rule is you have to go to school that day in order to use the park. And they've changed dramatically everything in their village without anything else because of those two rules. So it's very possible. A really important point. So my question is around the sourcing of female entrepreneurs or female founders. So um, I think given where we're at, the assumption is that some of us have graduate degrees or have socioeconomic status that allows us the privilege of accessing platforms and connections. How are you guys thinking about sourcing female-founded, female-led companies that might have the socioeconomic backgrounds that wouldn't even begin to understand where to go or how to really scale um, the businesses that usually fundamentally are solving local, community-based, low-income, people of color problems? I, I think that's a great question. I mean, we spend a lot of time on our team thinking about how we make sure that we are um, being mindful of having diversification in our channels on sourcing. Um, you know, I, we, we do you know, have relationships with um, banks and other institutions, but that is still going to be part of the construct of the problem you're raising. Um, I, I would also say we certainly look for, um, you know, finding companies that have been able to gone, go through accelerators or maybe are social uh, oriented. But I would, I would go back to, um, you know, there is a hard reality that if you are building a business that you're looking for venture funding and your business is appropriate for venture funding, Unfortunately, you do have to figure out how to get at least in some of the right channels um, because it's really hard to necessarily, in a sea of um, rice, pinpoint and find those that you know don't stick out as naturally. Um, and, I, and I do think that, especially for businesses that are solving local community problems, that um, you know, really, really important businesses that are social and oriented, there are um, some great programs out there that are more community development, you know, the financing that is appropriate for those kinds of businesses. Um, so, you know, I think that um, that's another area where we try to do our part in getting out and speaking and, and attending, um, um, you know, platforms and conversations to also build awareness around different types of funding and the ways to, you know, to access different types of funding for different types of businesses. Um, so, I'll answer just on, the, on a different, so for us it's more sourcing even in terms of employees and, and trying to go outside of that. So, and, we, and yeah, and so for us, you know, one thing we have noticed um, and that we've become more intentional about is, you know, we don't really get a lot of diverse candidates, um, on especially on like senior level positions. So, so one thing myself and my co-founder have sort of been talking about is how do we, you know, how do we go into these communities and, and make sure that we're, we're, you know, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy to some extent, right? People are interested in startups or, you know, kind of like know about the space and know the upside, et cetera. So like, how do you go beyond, beyond that? And so that's something that we have been focused on and being intentional about. And I think that's sort of part of that too, because if you can get diverse candidates to work in startups, they will see that it's possible for them to also start their own companies. So I think like this is also a different, w an another way to solve that problem. Really good point because it's also the network effect of being also then having the relationships of the funders. I mean, if you really look at, and there was a great article that we often reference um, in Fast Company, um, I think it was almost dated back to like 2014, but it really looked at a Y Combinator cohort that Dropbox was in. It had one other woman who was in the cohort of 30 companies or so, but it has this amazing web of all the uh, ways of, I will call it value exchange and currency, you know, is not just money. It is door opening, relationships, product collaboration. That's such a key part. And you know, oftentimes the conversation about the PayPal mafia, well, they were all employees, some of them immigrants, not necessarily from backgrounds that would have been plugged into traditional venture. They made their money and then it created that multiplier effect of what I talked about before. So I think that employee and funding and giving people those entrees and access is important too. Hi, my name is Linda. I am the founder of a, a platform that's actually for women to support women, and I'm really inspired by what each of you are doing. So um, 
I'm really in inspired. So um, my question is in regards to changes in uh, funding models, um, I was wondering if you could touch upon your experience with B Corps and sort of the new trends and funding differences that you've seen in that realm. I, I don't know. I, I would say, I mean, there's certainly a lot more happening on B Corps, which I think is fantastic. Um, I don't know that um, I have a lot of examples of other types of financing specifically for B Corps, but I can tell you we see more and more B Corps. We certainly see more funds that have a, in the venture space um, a I, I don't know, I, I hate to use the word impact orientation, but I would say orientation towards B Corp or, or you know, oriented companies. Um, you know, they may not all be B Corps, but I think there is this growing, I mean, look, when you have Larry Fink writing the op-ed in the New York Times, and when you have, you know, uh, Morgan Stanley and all these big corporates now having impact platforms, people are really, uh, I think we're still in the early days of this journey of moving, beyond, moving from philanthropy to impact to something more. And, it, and I think you will continue to see more um, dedicated sources of capital that are backing businesses that have um, you know, a productive orientation. It may not all be defined as B Corps, but a lot of them are, even if they don't have that certification. We were cursed, but we're not. <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff Trotter, uh, an aspiring social billionaire. I, I label myself. Um, a shameless social plug. Social billionaire. Social billionaire, yes. Nice. I like that. Awesome. <laughs> uh, basically, to positively impact a billion lives through the work I do, you know, socially and environmentally. Um, and a shameless plug for a, a gender diverse co founded um, consultancy agency that can really help you and your clients with their narrative and shaping it group called Grounded World, based here in New York City, and I can talk to you a little bit more about those later, but at grounded.world, you can find out all about them. A question, or two-part question. Um, there are many organizations that I'm aware of, um, again, gender diverse, women-led, for sure, um, that are in a, a community called Zebras Unite. I don't know if you've heard of Zebras Unite, but they typically eschew the, the typical route of raising funding. They would love to be a multi-million dollar value business, not necessarily billion dollar value business, so don't necessarily wish to become a unicorn, but are looking for funding mechanisms. And I just wonder if you're aware of them, and is, is that something, that, is that a group, a community that you could help? Uh, that's part of, part of my question. I'm familiar with Zebras Unite now, I'm very interested in yeah. Yeah, that. They're based in San Francisco, but they're pretty much everywhere. And uh, yeah. so Zebras Unite, great organization. And the, the, the second uh, question is largely around Hearst and the lab. It seems to me hugely successful. And full disclosure, I know an organization that's currently going through a process to, to hopefully become uh, part of the lab. Um, what um, ideas do you have or aspirations do you have to think about replicating the lab? How can you indicate how successful you have been to other corporations so that they might follow that example and see that there is a path to growth that is possibly not necessarily being thought of right now. Yeah, I mean, this is the example with the healthcare, healthcare companies. Um, and the reason I think we've um, agreed to sort of take them on as a, uh, again, you know, an iterative, uh, you know, beta, if you will, is that, you know, Hearst is in healthcare, the lab has been successful, these are women who are in very senior positions in those companies. You know, that's a critical thing. You've got to have support from the very top. The CEO has to buy in, and then you've got to have a core group of at least 10 women who are senior in the organization who are going to just, they're going to stop at nothing. So one of the things we're actually talking about is whether or not we might um, provide them with quote-unquote consulting help to actually... Uh, set up their labs and you know we're in the process of it because one of the things is you, you you always worry about when something is successful 
do you want to scale it, right? I mean, we're sort of the antidote to bigness in a funny kind of way, even though it's become big and the numbers have become big. And so, you know, there's some people at Hearst who walk into my office and say, you know, here's the growth engine of the future. You know, take a quarter of a billion from this and this and this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, that's not what we do. But on the other hand, if you don't do something, someone else, you know. So it's a, it's a constantly an iterative process. I think our plan is, in this November set of meetings, is to identify three to five of them that would actually really do the heavy lifting, but we could provide the, the modeling for them. And in that context, I will tell you, we decided yesterday that we're going to hire another fellow. We have five fellows in the lab, some of them who are here now. Um, but we're going to hire another fellow, uh, hopefully someone coming from business school, who can help with more modeling things and what would a lab look like to explain to somebody else. We're pretty good at marketing. We're pretty good at sales. We're pretty good at storytelling. But, and we're very good at finances for Hearst companies, but you don't want to put too much pressure on the businesses. So I think we're going to have our own um, fellow who will come in and be part of that project. So it's a, a type of your zebra project, if you will. But I thank you for that. That's it. I, I'll just add, um, just by from being part of the lab, I think what's very unique about the model that Hearst has built is um, the fact that the Hearst employees are such a big part of the success. So, you know, what makes this very interesting is, you know, of course it's about helping the companies, but it's also there is something in it for them, which is to help them also um, sort of climb the corporate ladder. And, and you know, this is sort of, I've seen it firsthand. Um, people are genuinely looking to help. Um, they, it's, it's, it's been incredible. And I think, you know, if that can be replicated across other organizations, it would be amazing. I think that's such an important point because in my view, um, you know, I think we have to continue to arm women with other forms of currency in their own rising in their careers uh, across in different ways that is mostly around, you know, kind of so where is the world going? What do they know? What can they bring to the table? Or relationships or, you know, knowledge and relationships. And I, I do think that traditional women's networking programming, which takes me back to the original part of my journey. I was part of a women's you know, uh, conference at Citibank and felt, wow, this is a little bit fatigued in terms of the conversation we're having. Um, I was yearning for, well, how do we really think about you know, playing bigger and coming to the table with knowledge about new technologies or new companies and what, what, how they're fitting into different industries and landscapes or you know, being aware of, you know, watching the cycles, the ups and the downs of a business and how, and, and uh, you know, how they, you know, get product market adoption. I think there's something really big there for corporates and they do a lab. I think it's a beautiful thing you guys have done at Hearst. I think it's so important because I definitely think that especially while we still in corporate America try to figure out how to get more equity in P&L ownership for women, they're, you know, a nice way to at least address some of that learning experience is having them participate and learn from, and it's, and it's connected to the board issue. Because at the end of the day, it goes back to the you know clubbing networking thing that goes on. When you have skin in the game and you're invested in a deal or you know about a deal and if you don't invest, you're in a conversation with others bringing something to the table that's unique and different and it gets you into another conversation where they think about you and it's top of mind on another deal or a company that's bringing on a board member or needs a corporate, you know, you know, enterprise client or, or partnership. And it gives women a way to bring something else, you know, to the tables where they have a seat. And going back to the international uh, comment that was made, I think that's important. Uh, you know, our lab in the Netherlands, our lab in um, uh, the UK, and uh, our flow of deals coming from Israel are all examples of women who've created something amazing. Uh, and they've the market, the product market fit is there. They just need the big market. And so that's one of the things, if you're not going to have you know, big venture funding, you've got to find other outlets to kind of iterate. But if you're coming from Israel and you're moving to New York, there's a whole cultural, you know, moving to a new country, a uh, little bit less from the Netherlands. But so what these women are doing is using all three, in that instance, you know, the UK, the Netherlands, the, in New York, as their, as their lab ground, no matter where they're coming from around the world. And that's been uh, another, I think, another sort of surprise to us in terms of how productive a corporate can be where you know a venture is typically in a country that it's investing from. So, you know, being a global company has allowed us to uh, to do that. We are actually one more question. One more question, Kyle. We have one. What? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> 
Oh, hi, my name is Alex. I'm a senior at Barnard College, and I'm in the beginning stages of building a company in a class called the Social Action Project. And I was wondering, do you guys have any advice on the very, very, very early stages in terms of idea formation and being nimble, but also structured in your thought? Yeah, I, I mean, in the early days, it's um, it's about you know trying to talk, get in front of your customers, um, whoever your target customer is, and um, and really, you know, try to prove out if there is, uh, like, how big of a business is there. And I'll, like, use me as an example. So when I came up with the idea, I had to, I wanted to validate if this is a big problem that everybody is going to want to address it the way I thought about it. And so I, like, went back on Craigslist and tried, you know, like, put some fake listings up there and like with delivery and see how people responded to it and then put a landing page and you know paid like $100 on Google Ads to see how many people would sign up. Stuff like that just to validate how big of an idea and how big of an opportunity it is before I built any line of code. Um, and I think like that's the big part when you're starting to think about building a business is you know you want to sort of they always talk about MVP, um, a minimum viable product and so like what is your MVP? Um, and from there, you know, if you can validate that, then you can start sort of adding. But try to try to do something lean and light, and get in front of customers as quickly as possible. And and I would just add while he's walking, I would just say, you know, really doing that testing to make sure it's a must-have, not a nice-to-have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say a lot of companies get a, you know up and running, make it angel or seed funding, but fundamentally they're a nice-to-have, they're not a must-have, and it's going to hard be hard to have a big growth trajectory. Thank you. Um, my, my name is Camille. I'm a uh, founder of a company that's now over 10 years old, and uh, I really appreciated a lot of the things that you touched today. Um, we've never fundraised, and we've been profitable uh, year over year, and we touch a very delicate subject. We work in sustainable fashion, which is now everywhere, and our jewelry um, article 22, I don't know if anyone has heard about it, is directly inspired by the UN development goals and um, is made from peace bomb aluminum recycled from war bombs in Laos. And um, since we were born, we cleared um, over 300,000 square meters of land, uh, contaminated in land in Laos. So really strong subject. And um, we've grown year over year. And one aspect that you've touched here is about um, the idea that investors need to go. It's all about... Um, relationship, right? And uh, that's a key value to a company, any project. And you need to go beyond the simple valuation because um, each founder has his own vision and uh, that's what he's looking to develop. And one question to you is, what is the sizing that you're looking at? Because for us, one thing that's really important in our company, we have incredible mentors, uh, men, but coming from industries of women, uh, which is luxury industries in skincare and high end joy. And, um, you know, when we go out to fundraise, it's all about what's your valuation, give us the cap structure. The reality, when you build up a sustainable um, supply chain with people that are working so remotely, and I can tell you that a uh, very big fashion company are trying to do so, and it's going to be really hard for them to bring people you know, in so much remote areas to create actually really strong and true sustainable um, supply chain. So these are all actually a brand like us have built year over year, and that's the value of the brand. So I, I was reading a little bit online, and, you know, all of this is for us. In general, it's not about the money that you're going to fundraise. It's about the people that you're going to bring in. And with a little capital, with a strong ID and a very strong engagement from consumers to this is what's really important, this is what we believe in. So it's not about how much you fundraise. Uh, to my point is, what is the, what do you look, because I see minimums of like, you know, company sizing, which in our case, when you talk about sustainable uh, supply chain, is not specifically adapted to a company that we're trying to create. Not that we will not grow exponentially, but it's not adapted in the short term. So my question is a little bit about sizing of the companies you've invested, you know, um, in relation to, I'm sure you invest in companies that are not yet profitable, uh, but are small, others that might be much bigger. So it's, it's a little bit, um, yeah. 
Um, well, I, I, uh, I, I mean, I can talk about what our focus is, but I would say, you know, to, to get at maybe what part of your question is for you as you think about the right investor base, and I don't know where you are in terms of numbers, um, you know, it does go back to, and you, you made the point on, on, on fundraising and valuation, um, I, this part of the point I was making earlier is you do have to understand the business model of venture firms, and venture firms may not be the right sources of capital. There's been a, you know, there's definitely a lot of family offices and um, some other sources of capital that aren't necessarily looking for those consistent upticks on valuation. Because the way venture capital firms are evaluated is the performance of their underlying portfolio. And by nature of that, that, do, that is why they are looking for growth on valuation because it's the only way they can be measured in their own success for how much uptick. If they put you know, $100 million to work or even $50 million to work, they're probably going to do that with $2 million checks in 30 companies. And those, you know, $2 million checks on companies that have valuations of, say, I don't know, 20 million, they want those 20 million valuations to go to 50 and 100 and 500 and have an exit. They're looking for, you know, companies that can have somewhere between a 5 and 10x. Because traditionally, venture, a portfolio of, call it, you know, 30 companies, a third of them are going to fail, a third will be flat, and a third will carry the portfolio. And so, you know, I... Personally, I think we're not, you know, we're, we're not going to change the venture model. The venture model exists for a reason, and it's not a bad one. It's just you need to understand the nature of the beast and whether you fit within that, or you need to fit within another, you know, uh, form of capital sourcing that is looking for different returns because they're valuating things in a different way, um, which may be, you know, um, foundation PRI money, or it may be um, family office money, or or labs. I mean, you know. You guys are obviously looking for returns too, but you know may have a longer time horizon. You're not measuring it in the same way. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.